Hello and welcome to IC Healer's YouTube presentation. I'm Mandy, the founder of IC Healer. IC Healer is an online clinic that serves to help educate individuals with interstitial cystitis and bladder pain syndrome to help individuals identify their root cause and find healing opportunities so they can live the life they deserve. Now, before we begin, I just want to remind you that the purpose of this presentation is for informational purposes only and not intended to be a substitute for medical advice. Always seek the advice of your physician with any questions you have regarding a medical condition. Now, if you're tuning in here, you're probably searching for answers like I was four years ago. Those of you who know my story, I suffered with ICBPS for about 10 years. I had reached the pit of my struggles with this debilitating condition about four to five years ago in which I decided it was time to turn things around and I started to aggressively pursue my credentials in functional nutrition. Now, back when I first received my FDN certification, I was introduced to a food sensitivity test. Now, this was a rather unique idea for me at that time, but I decided to give it a shot and it was one of the best decisions I made for myself. You see, the IC diet never worked for me. I always found foods that the IC diet told me to avoid never bothered me, but then there seemed to be other foods that I didn't tolerate well. So through food sensitivity testing, I found that there were several foods I was eating on a pretty regular basis, such as chicken, and it was actually one of the main culprits of inflammation in my body. This was the start of my ability to drastically be able to lower my pain levels. So what's going on here? Now, the IC Healer course goes into detail on the immunological responses to food. But for those of you who are new to this, the course is a great place to start. I'll quickly summarize um, what I go over in the course, but in a perfect world with optimal gut health and optimal immune responses to food, you have what's called tolerance to food. Now, this is the healthy response to food that we all want. And as this slide demonstrates, you produce things like TGF-beta, IgA, and then you have this T regulatory response, and all is good. However, that is not the case in impaired immune regulation and gut dysfunction. There's various biochemical and immunological processes that occur when we eat certain foods that promote inflammation. And I've discussed this many times, inflammation can lead to tissue damage and lots of pain, which we are all familiar with. In fact, inflammation is one of the primary associations in ICBPS and lately has been considered one of the etiologies. Now, I wanna quickly clarify a few definitions before we begin, because there's a lot of words misused when it comes to food sensitivities. So here are some of the IFM definitions. Now, when we talk about food allergy, as many allergists will discuss with you, we're talking about an IgE-mediated reaction. Now, this normally occurs within hours, so you're gonna get a response pretty quickly. And it involves some type of histamine reaction. So if you have an allergy to something, chances are you're more than likely gonna know. Now, a food sensitivity, as is defined, is immune-mediated as well, but it's not IgE-mediated. Um, and it can actually take about up to 72 hours to manifest. So this is where majority of us are kind of in that category of food sensitivities. Usually it happens within a couple of days. It's not immediate and it's not as obvious as a food allergy. And finally, the word that's really misused often is food intolerance. And to be honest, that's not even immune uh, mediated. Um, and this is what we refer to as lactose intolerance. So it, most of us listening here, we're probably dealing with a sensitivity. So I just wanted to clarify that before we begin. Okay. So without any more delay, let me introduce Dr. Evans. He's got a very diverse background, and I think he's going to be giving us a wealth of knowledge today. He is a board-certified OBGYN and also an international lecturer. He is the medical director of KBMO Diagnostics, which is the FIT test, which is the one that I um, discuss in my course. And um, he specializes in identifying foods that can cause inflammation in the body. He's also the director of the Center for Functional Medicine in Stanford, Connecticut. And he's a member of the senior faculty of the Institute for Functional Medicine. He continues to serve as the external lead of the IFM Advanced Practice Module in Hormone Health since its inception in 2011. 
and he's the founding diplomat of the American Board of Holistic Medicine and is recognized as the first physician in Connecticut to be board certified in both integrative medicine and obstetrics and gynecology. Now, Dr. Evans serves as a peer reviewer for the journals um, of Alternative Therapies in Health and Medicine and Global Advances in Health and Medicine and is a member of the Editorial Advisory Board of Holistic Primary Care. And he also authored a chapter on nutrition and sociogenomics. And very interestingly, it, he also pursues studies in spirituality, metaphysics, personal transformation for many years, and has recently created a core curriculum designed to share ancient spiritual wisdom with others to help bring health and happiness into their lives. So as you can see, Dr. Evans has a very diverse background, and we are honored to have the opportunity to interview with him for our channel. So without any more delay, let me introduce Dr. Evans. Hello. Hey there, Mandy. Hello, everybody. We are so happy to have you today. Um, and so this is going to be very, very interesting for our, our community, um, this discussion. So before we begin, um, tell us a little bit about you. So how long have you been a medical doctor? and what what made you choose the area of specialty that you did? So I've been in practice about 30 years. And I originally chose OBGYN because I love delivering babies. I love the excitement that came with that. I love doing surgery. I love taking care of patients continually over a long period of time and having a sense of continuity and connection. And it was just the right specialty for me. That's awesome. I bet it is pretty rewarding. Um, so when did you tr kind of cross over, I guess is the word I should use, into functional medicine? And what made you want to do that? So I crossed over when I realized that my training, which was top notch, I had been to great institutions and done very well there, didn't prepare me for answering simple questions like someone with breast cancer asked me, does it matter what I eat? Mm. And when I said, well, ask your oncologist, they said, no, just eat donuts to keep your weight up. And she said, I don't think that really makes sense. Can you investigate that for me? Because I had a good connection with her. And then I realized uh, <laughs> at the time that there were over 8,000 articles on sugar and cancer. And it was in that moment that I realized there was a lot I didn't learn in medical school and uh, found functional medicine and never looked back. Well, we're glad that you did that. Um, so um, when you, you are, you said you're a senior faculty in IFM. So when did you join um, IFM? Um, and actually that's um, where a lot of our training in school has been through the IFM Institute as well. And what's your role? and how long you had this role. So right now I'm part of the senior faculty of IFM. We call ourselves educators now. And I've been with IFM easily 15 years and uh, have been teaching in their AFMCP, their basic, sort of we call it basic training, the basic introductory course to functional medicine. As you said, I am the lead for the advanced practice in hormone health, the advanced practice module, and I lecture all over the world for IFM. Very nice. Um, so then what, um, when did you become interested in the FIT test, um, KBMO? Um, yeah, KBMO, and um, what's your role? When did you join them? And just tell us a little bit about how all that evolved. So this is sort of a, a really nice story is I was at, a conference and I specifically targeted some of my staff. I said, I want you to go to some of the different booths of the food sensitivity labs and tell me what you think. And the reason I tasked somebody to do that, one of my nurses, I tasked her to do that because I knew as a clinician, number one, that inflammation is the underlying problem for so much complex chronic disease that we see, not only in society, but in my office. And number two is I'm concerned about the relationship between what we eat, what we put into our mouth, which is something that we do two or three times a day, and the relationship of the foods we eat to inflammation. And I wanted a lab test 
that could help me do that because the way that I was doing it at the time was through the IFM elimination diet. And the elimination diet is very cumbersome, it's complicated, and patients don't like that. Mm -hmm. And the second issue with the elimination diet is that there are triggers of inflammation that don't give symptoms. So just using symptoms as the way to define a food that creates inflammation isn't really all that accurate. In fact, now we know that most of the food reactions that happen in the body are symptom free. Mm -hmm. And it's just, they just release those pro-inflammatory cytokines. Exactly, so, yeah. Um, and that's interesting because that creates a little bit of pushback from patients when they say, well, this food comes up, you know, I know you mentioned chicken, so we'll use chicken. And they say, well, chicken comes up, but I can eat chicken without a problem. And I'm saying, and my response is, well, that's without a problem that you know of. Because I know from this test, and we'll go into it, but I know that chicken provokes an inflammatory response in your body, whether you have symptoms or not and it's not good for you. Exactly, yeah, that's why I brought that up because that was a revelation for me. I um, was eating it every day, <laughs> twice a day, which probably was part of the problem too. I wasn't yeah. rotating my food. And that was exactly what was happening and that's, that was when I removed it, I saw a lot of improvements happening in my symptoms. Oh wow, so that's really good. So, um, well, let's go ahead and talk about this food sensitivity test then and let, let us, you know, I know you, you have a really good um, background in it, so if you wanna go ahead and share your screen, we can go over the food sensitivity test with the audience here. Sure, so I actually have a little slide deck prepared. Perfect. Because I, I think it's important um, for everybody to understand um, this relationship, right? Mm -hmm. So let's talk about this. And What we see, and this is the slide I use when I teach doctors, the most effective clinical outcomes across all disease spectrums result from normalization of gut function. And interstitial cystitis and bladder pain syndrome are part of this disease spectrum because it's all diseases that we're talking about. So that's why this talk is important. The gut houses two thirds of the immune system Interstitial cystitis is inflammation in the bladder wall. So obviously the immune system is very much involved in this issue. And so problems with gut health, like what I'm gonna be talking about a term called increased intestinal permeability or increased permeability and eating foods that cause an inflammatory reaction in the gut are really problems for overall health. And so what we're talking about now is that part of the digestive tract called the small intestine. So, you know, food goes down the esophagus from the stomach into the small intestine, then through the large intestine and out through the rectum and anus. And so the small intestine is where many of the nutrients are absorbed. So what is leaky gut? Leaky gut is something you may not have heard about. Leaky gut is another term for increased intestinal permeability. Permeability, as you know, is the ability for a substance to move across a membrane. And so we're talking now about the intestinal membrane or the intestinal wall. And if we have increased intestinal permeability, what it means is that things move through at a higher rate than they should. So if we think of the intestinal wall as having these little holes in them, and then there are toll takers that let molecules through only at an appropriate time, so after they've paid the toll, for example, so it's a controlled crossing of the membrane. That's what's supposed to happen. And so what we see here is the inside of the small intestine, and this is the outside or the lining of the small intestine, and what we see normally is we things go through the small intestine and only the things that are supposed to pass through the toll booth pass through the toll booth. And you see the cells are nice and tight together. We call those healthy cell junctions. Those cell junctions are tight. We call those tight cell junctions. 
What happens in a leaky gut is you can see that these cell junctions are now damaged. So things can leak on through. You also see something called poor absorption. And whereas we had a beautiful, fine-tuned carpet, shag carpet, if you will, lining the small intestine, now we see that there's damage. So what happens when you have food that goes down is that you have a lot more things pass through those toll booths because there aren't any attendants here. And so things just pass through indiscriminately. That's called leaky gut. The reason that's a problem for patients with IC and BPS is because that creates inflammation in the immune system because as I said, the gut is the largest immune organ of the body. And so when you have these food particles that go through the leak that aren't supposed to go through, they are picked up by the immune system and the immune system becomes inflamed and irritated. So increased epithelial permeability, that's what we just talked about, is a crucial either primary or secondary event in the pathogenesis in the cause of several disorders. An intact barrier, therefore, is critical to normal function and prevention of disease. So here you see the leaking is the cause of many problems, and an intact barrier is important for healthy function. And here we see in a review paper that the cause of a number of diseases is associated with a dysfunctional intestinal barrier. So I'm just gonna go through just some easy ones right off the bat with infertility, pregnancy loss in the first trimester, and here we see inflammatory joint diseases, intestinal inflammation causes the distribution systemically means throughout the body of potentially injurious macromolecules or large molecules. So this is the place where you start understanding the connection to IC because this intestinal inflammation leads to these chemicals that go into the circulation and can end up in the bladder. It can also end up in the ovary, and that leads to impaired hormone production that can lead to infertility and all sorts of other problems. Here we see a paper looking at these pro-inflammatory chemicals that are created from sensitivity and inflammation and that leaky gut and how that has a problem or an association with infertility, implantation or failure of an embryo, to implant and grow, recurrent miscarriage, and then complications of pregnancy. And here we see how everything relates with pregnancy loss, where when we have leaky gut, we go from a normal 20% pregnancy loss rate to 31%. So it increases by 50% just when there is leaky gut. And here we see that modification of the bacteria in the gut, which would help leaky gut. So that's an important reason to take a probiotic, for example, could provide a therapy for female infertility. But it's not just about fertility. It even is about cancer. So a strong intestinal barrier can prevent cancer in the rest of the body. This is why this is such an important topic. So a leaky gut, the root of some cancers in the rest of the body. And here we see the paper talking about the mechanism of how that happens. And now we see that what they call epithelial barrier dysfunction is the technical term for leaky gut. And that causes autoimmune diseases like type one diabetes, multiple sclerosis, asthma, food allergies, hypersensitivity, and even cancer. And again, leaky gut causing cancer and other chronic diseases as well. And that's where I see and bladder pain syndrome kicks in. Here we see breast and colon specifically saying that studies have shown that weight gain, metabolic stress causes increased gut permeability which causes breast and colon cancer. 
after cancer treatment, intestinal permeability is important because it can help reduce the symptoms of cancer treatment. So obviously increased intestinal permeability is quite important. We want to have normal intestinal permeability, not increased. So when we look at food intolerance and intestinal permeability, 50 to 100% of food intolerant patients have increased intestinal permeability. This is the link. This is why food testing is so important because if we do food test sensitivity testing and we find that you have foods that create inflammation, that's likely to cause leaky gut and all of these problems. So impaired intestinal permeability or leaky gut is present in all subjects with adverse reactions to food. And so what are the triggers of increased intestinal permeability? Well, all sorts of things, right? Stress, not eating the right foods, systemic disease, et cetera. But what I think is important for you to see and what's important for this presentation is that food allergy sensitivity and intolerance changes altered, changes the intestinal permeability. That leads to immune activation. That leads to systemic disease. Interstitial cystitis is clearly immune activation. And that's why I'm here doing this YouTube video right now. So IgG food sensitivity is one type, one arm of the immune system. This is not the arm of the immune system that causes your throat to close up or you to die. This is what just creates inflammation in all parts of the body and the bladder is one of them. And what's important here is just to know that this, these antibodies, the way your immune system works to help the body and protect the body has a half-life of three weeks. Therefore, you need to be off the food for at least six weeks to have those antibodies go away. So when do I do food sensitivity testing? If my patient doesn't feel well, has any kind of thyroid issue, joint issue, brain fog, fatigue, digestion and gut issues, infertility or first trimester loss, fibroids, endometriosis, breast or any other cancer, and of course, I see. So the reason I do it is because the immune complex issues and inflammation that are associated with food is an underlying problem for all of the conditions that I see on a daily basis and certainly for IC. And the literature, we're going to take a little walk through the literature for all the different diseases and then we're going to get to IC. So if you do an IgG based test and you avoid those foods, then even if you have, you know, sort of general food intolerance, your symptoms get better after two months. This is looking at children um, that have inflammation and issues with their carotid intima, which means they're already showing vascular disease and inflammation. And if you had a lot of food sensitivity, you were gonna have a high CRP, which is a blood test for inflammation, and you'd have an abnormal carotid artery. Mm. Migraines. If we identify foods with IgG testing in patients that have migraines, you avoid the foods, you stop having the migraines. IBS, same thing. Um, if you have irritable bowel and you do the test and you avoid the foods, then what's called the IBS symptom severity score reduces 10% greater than if you just did a false diet. And here we see the advantages of being really good in adhering to that diet. Right. Then, when we look at this paper, this is a paper that's done with a different type of test. And this shows that the symptom severity score was reduced by 66. And this is the kind of test which 
people in the marketplace say, oh, well, maybe we should do. This is about what different white blood cells produce. And we'll talk about the differences at the end about our test versus this test. And this is something called the leukocyte or a white blood cell activation test. Crohn's disease. This shows that we can reduce Crohn's disease symptoms in 84 and 83% of the patients just by doing the diet. Same thing with migraine and irritable bowel, symptoms got better. So remember, increased intestinal permeability causes food sensitivity. Food sensitivity causes increased intestinal permeability. This, this arrow goes both ways. It's what we call a bi-directional arrow. Now let's look at interstitial cystitis and bladder pain syndrome. So here we see increased pro-inflammatory cytokines, C-reactive protein, nerve growth factor. So what this shows is that in the blood of people that have interstitial cystitis, we see these pro-inflammatory chemicals. So it's not a condition that's localized to the bladder. Thus, for some patients, it's considered a chronic inflammatory disease. So if we're looking at all the different ways to reduce ICBPS, how do we reduce chronic inflammation throughout the body? The way to do that is to work on foods. People put food in their body three times a day. Now, <clears throat> this is another paper looking at interstitial cystitis saying that it often coexists with irritable bowel syndrome. So people with interstitial cystitis often have gut symptoms. And this is not a surprise because interstitial cystitis is a inflammation-based issue and people with IBS or irritable bowel often have leaky gut and increased intestinal permeability. So it all links together. And you heard Mandy talk about diet, right? So what's the role of diet? So there are these quote unquote, I see diets. Well, it has to be individualized, right? So 90% of patients that have I see BPS report sensitivities to different foods. So people know that food causes flares in their ICBPS. And this suggests that a controlled method to determine dietary symptomatology or to determine dietary sensitivities, such as an elimination diet, may play an important role. Well, guess what? An elimination diet has you eliminate so many foods. Isn't it easier to just do a simple test so you know what you need to eliminate? That's what's the wonder of this test and why I'm here doing this YouTube video for you guys. Mm -hmm. So then there's a question. Does everybody with IC have to avoid gluten? I'm sure this is something you've asked your provider. This is something you've probably thought about or asked yourself. And the answer is no. Then there's the... <laughs> 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 cartoon and everybody chuckles when they see this right but no this doesn't have to be you right there is something called gluten freedom dr alessio fasano who is probably one of the pioneers in gluten issues and founded the center for celiac research at harvard he happens to be on our team for kbmo oh. We'll talk about that later, but he clearly says you don't have to avoid gluten unless it causes a problem for you. So not everybody has to avoid gluten. And that's then, a relief. That's a relief. Yeah, and this is the person who has done the first studies, the first work showing that gluten causes immune responses. So wow. it's only genetically susceptible people that have to worry. Now, <clears throat> if we're doing IgG testing, 
there are certain lab issues that science people have to worry about. I'm telling you as the medical director, and we are a certified lab, so every certifying agency tells us that we do everything right. And this is a complicated picture, and all you need to get from this is an understanding of how this test works. So what we do is we prick your finger, or if you prefer a blood draw, it's a blood draw, but a finger prick is easier because it can be done anywhere. We put your blood in a, <clears throat> on a little card, we send it off to a lab in Massachusetts, and then we run it um, over different plates of food. So your blood is exposed to food. And if your blood sticks to the food, it means that you have antibodies, an immune reaction to the food. If your blood flows directly over the food and doesn't get stuck, then there's no immune reaction there. So our test determines what food plates have stuck blood. And then we do a special test to see if there's something called complement, which mm -hmm. is a chemical that the body produces when there's inflammation. So in order for our test to be positive, to identify a food, it has to get stuck with both complement and the immunoglobulin. And that's what makes our test different from any of the other tests. And that's why our test is designed to find foods that cause inflammation. So we measure 132 foods and additives, or 22, depending on the patient preference. The 22 food is obviously a little bit less expensive. The finger step is quick and easy. This is what it looks like. It's just five drops of blood. And the report is very easy to understand. You look at the red, the yellow, and the orange, and those are the foods you have to avoid. We test for chemical additives because some people need to know that they shouldn't have MSG. Some of them, you know, shouldn't be taking aspartame because that's bad for them. So we check for food additives, certain dyes, etc. And then we can actually diagnose leaky gut on this test because if you have candida, which is a fungal uh, sensitivity, that means that there's some leak. So your immune system has been exposed to the candida or the fungus, the yeast. And so that means you have leaky gut. The newer testing for the leaky gut is a zonulin test. This was designed by Dr. Fasano. And basically, zonulin is a protein that separates the cells. It opens those tight junctions. And what it does is it lets things come in. Now, it turns out that gliadin or wheat and certain bacteria also cause zonulin to be secreted and released. So zonulin, as I said, is a protein and it's a marker for intestinal permeability and it's reversible and we see elevated zonulin in all of these different issues. And our tests are all reproducible. So we do reproducibility of over 98% in our samples. In terms of our clinical studies, here you see that we can reduce the inflammatory chemicals by avoiding the foods that we test positive for. How, many, how much time is in between those two tests? So with this one is 10 months. Ah, okay. But we don't need to do that. As I said, I'm fine with three months. This is just a study. This was just the study. And then we did our own study looking at patients that had IBS. And IBS, you know, is very common. Almost 20% of people have it. It's gas and bloating and diarrhea and constipation. And it's a very expensive disease. And people that have it are really disabled and are uncomfortable with it. 
So we looked at 100 IBS patients that were over 21 and were sick, meaning they had a symptom severity score of greater than 175, and that they were going to continue on whatever medication they were on, and they were going to follow a food plan that we gave them based on their testing. And so what we looked at for 100 patients was a 50% reduction in primary care visits, which we think will improve, and 126 point decrease in IBS severity score, the control group 46. So we did three times better than the control, and that's an 80 different, 80 <clears throat> score number difference, and that's clinically and statistically significant. Homocysteine, which is an amino acid that causes damage in blood vessels, also decreased, and in the control group it increased, and CRP went down as well. That's a marker of inflammation. And when we look here, comparing this test, our test did better than just IgG alone. This is a 10% reduction in symptom severity score. And here we see the patients in the white blood cell test. We did better than they did. Right, so that was only a 60 reduction in score. Now, let's look at one case. This is a 22 year old male with worsening vitiligo. This is a good case because vitiligo we know is an autoimmune disease and an inflammatory disorder. No significant medical history other than small stable patches of vitiligo for six years. No significant history. Both his parents appeared at his college graduation and his mother, who is a dermatologist, started to cry because this is what she saw. Look at those white patches, those deep pigmented patches. Mm. It's an autoimmune disease for which there is really nothing that you can do in the dermatology world. So then his functional medicine oriented father, um, came on board and said, you know what, we need to do this fit test. And uh, you can see that he had some sensitivities here. And he avoided those foods. And after four months, look, these are both my two boys, but my son on the right that had the vitiligo, look at the difference, nice, healthy skin. And so all I can tell you is it works. It works on my patients and it works on my family. And so it's highly sensitive, it's accurate. We do all of the sort of backroom stuff that's important, excellent outcomes, and a growing list of thought leaders are adopting their test and their practices. So the final thought is, as Hippocrates says, all disease begins in the gut. I've shown you about this connection between gut issues and ICBPS. How do we reduce the gut issues by reducing foods that cause inflammation? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. That was really awesome. Um, very informative. So uh, can we just talk about gluten real quick before um, we close? I was very sure. fascinated with that because that um, I didn't realize that Dr. Fasano was on, on the team. Um, yeah. I'm very familiar with his work. I've read his book and I've read a lot of his papers. And um, I was um, actually under the impression that um, from reading that, I thought maybe wheat was pr primarily the primary driver of the zonulin and the leaky gut, but he's changing his stance on that. Is that, is that what I'm understanding? Right. So if you look at the quotes on the slides, and if you look at the quote in his book, what it says is that everybody will have a reaction to gluten. So gluten does cause zonulin to be secreted. Gluten does cause these cells to separate in everybody, but that doesn't mean that it's a problem for everybody. And so- Okay, so even though the cells are opening, they've closed back up, are we saying? Exactly. exactly. Gotcha. So okay. that's a problem if people have a genetic predisposition, like we, we use this term HLA, DQ8, DQ2. Yeah. So, you know, so if you have that gene, then that opening and closing can be problematic. 
Sounds good. Okay. So that makes a lot of sense. And then um, what are your thoughts on the molecular mimicry theory with um, wheat and dairy? Well, I think molecular mimicry is a very important term that everybody needs to know, specifically as it applies to this testing. So molecular mimicry is that if you eat a food and your immune system is reacting to that food on our test, and you never have eaten that food, the reason it does that is called molecular mimicry, meaning there's been some bacteria, some virus, something that had an amino acid sequence that is the same as the amino acid sequence on the antibody that targeted that, let's say lipopolysaccharide on the cell membrane of a bacteria. And so if you were to eat that food, it would cause a problem. It's not that it says that you've been eating it and you're sensitive to it. So that's how molecular mimicry works with this test. In general, molecular mimicry refers to anything that the immune system attacks that has a similar structure to, let's say, a gland like the thyroid gland, and then you'll attack the thyroid gland because of food sensitivities. Right. We see that a lot with autoimmune thyroid. Okay. That's a really good clarification because I hear that a lot from people when they do the test, they say, well, I don't know why this food came up because I never have eaten that food. So that, right. that clarifies that very much. So really the bottom line is if your test comes back, whether or not you've eaten that food or not, you still should eliminate it because by doing so, you're going to reduce the inflammatory load on your body, given that you're compliant and you're it, the time is given, which you said about three Maybe months exactly. and that reduces the inflammation. And then the, I guess the other question I have with that is um, what's your thoughts on all or nothing principle in that if you cheat a little, I hear sometimes people say when they cheat, they get an overreaction. Like it's more heightened. Is that, is there truth to that? Well, <clears throat> I think that in general, it's important to always avoid the food. And if you eat something let's say you're eating something every day and you reduce it to once or twice a week, it's not gonna help you. If you've been eating it you know, every day and then over the four months you have it once, you may have a reaction to it because your body is going through this process of clearing itself from this food and so you're sort of been running clean and you're not used to people often don't understand that the way they're living their life they're in this state of chronic inflammation they don't realize how unwell they are and then all of a sudden they feel well they eat the food and then they have the reaction and that's why it's such a great difference because they're going from this place of now really increased health and then experiencing the inflammation um, does KBMO have um, dietitians that, that, you know, you, people who select the test that can actually walk them through a reintroduction period so they could do it properly? Absolutely. So you, when you get the test, you get a list of the foods that you need to avoid along with menu plans. So you know exactly what to do and, and how to eat. The reintroduction phase is something that a practitioner does individually with every patient. Yes, and that makes that, and that's a very important point that I wanted to clarify because I don't, I don't think people should be doing this by themselves. You know, because like you just said, you know, after three months, you know, you might have too much of something, and then you you feel like you're back to square one. So it's always good to work with somebody to help reintroduce that. And there's also an app. Am I correct with this? It is. Yes. Yes. So you can get your results on your app, and you get a list of the foods to avoid and recipes, and it can be very helpful. Yeah, you can take it to restaurants with you. Absolutely. Perfect. Well, thank you so much. This was great. I really appreciate your time. And um, is there a, a place people can, um, you know, reach any, you know, reach you guys directly? Uh, maybe like a website or something. Maybe we could put the link at the sure. bottom. There's, you know, there's kbmodiagnostics.com. Okay. Is our website. And uh, you can always email any kind of questions that you have to the, to the website, though. Um, we primarily deal with practitioners. Exactly. Well, thank you so much. It was great having you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.